This is John Cole with OKRaw.com to do another exciting episode for you and I'm coming at you from my front yard garden but this is not a gardening episode. What we're going to do is we're going to take you back in time actually to an event I did called the Health, Healing and Happiness event that took place in Las Vegas, Nevada last month actually. And uh, what I'd like to do is actually just share with all my viewers out there a presentation that I gave at this event actually. It's titled the top three ways to improve any diet. Now I don't care if you're on a vegan diet, I don't care if you're on a raw vegan diet, I don't care if you're on a whole food diet, I don't care if you're on a paleo diet, I don't care if you're on an omnivorous diet, and I don't even care if you're a carnivore, although I don't know humans and carnivores, that doesn't mix too well in my opinion. But nonetheless, one of the things that a healthy diet, in my opinion, has to do a lot about is how much fresh fruits and fresh vegetables you guys eat. And I don't care what kind of diet you're on, almost all diets you're going to include some kind of food from the earth, because that's where it all came from. And this topic is really important because unfortunately not a lot of people into health and educating about health talk about this topic. So you're going to want to stay tuned and watch this whole episode. And I know some of you guys might yip and yaw and John, it's too long. Well, this episode is packed with information and I want to encourage you guys, if you don't have the time to watch it, you know, watch it while you're cooking dinner, watch it while you're in the shower, watch it, you know, while you're in the car and, and download the MP3 version or, you know, click down here on one of these corners where there's like a little spoked wheel and click that and you could play it at two times speed so then you could understand me faster, but I already talked pretty fast. So anyways, that'll cut down the time in half, right? And you know, I want to let you guys know that there's no substitute for information. You know, knowledge is power, but what you, what, what, but what you do with that knowledge is even more powerful because you could have all the information, you know, but still not act and take action. So. The, the heartfelt thing I hope you guys do after watching this episode that I you know, took time to research, document, make a PowerPoint presentation is take action on some of the things that I'm sharing with you guys. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into that video. Hey everybody, thank you for attending my talk today at 9 a.m. early in the morning. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna be worth it. Uh, th you know, this, what I've learned that I'm gonna share with you guys is literally taking me 20 years. I started a plant-based raw food nutrient-dense diet based around fruits and vegetables in 1995. This is now 2015, if my math is correct. It's been 20 years since I've been doing this. And I think the first thing I want to ask you guys is how many of you guys have seen some of my videos online or maybe know about me? So a handful of people, so a lot of you guys still don't know who I am. So I'd like to just give a really brief synopsis of why I got into this. And that'll give you, uh, let you guys know more about me. So I got into this because I almost lost my life. You know, losing your life is not a fun place to be at any age, but especially right after you get out of college. So I was graduated from college. I was stricken with spinal meningitis, which many of you guys know is life-threatening and many people do not make it out of that situation. I can only say that I got out of that situation through higher powers because at that point I didn't know anything about raw food, diet, or health. But upon exiting the hospital, the doctor said that I had what's called complement immune deficiency, which is basically a chronically weak immune system, and they blamed it on my genes. And when they told me that, I wasn't actually too surprised because I had had things like allergies, asthma, and eczema, which are all autoimmune inflammatory type conditions, you know, since I was a child. So I had been plagued with these all growing up, and then I got spinal meningitis, almost lost my life. And I mean, I thought when I was in my 20s, I was like, man, this is not supposed to happen until you're like 65 or something. <laughs> uh, but it shouldn't even happen then, according to Dr. Joel Furman, if you eat properly, you can live well beyond 100, in my opinion, eating nutrient-dense foods. So anyways, like, after I got out of the hospital, doctors blamed my illness on my genes, that I had bad genes, and much like <laughs> the boy in the bubble, the 70s movie that many of you guys may remember, the guy I had to live in the bubble, and you know, that's like the extreme condition, you know, where he doesn't have an immune system. A normal person might be here and I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, so my immune system was not as strong. The doctor said that I could have a reoccurrence of the spinal meningitis or anything else uh, in the world. And can we get this monitor turned on? It's, uh, it's off. So I could have a reoccurrence of the spinal meningitis or anything else. And I, all I knew when I left the hospital is that, John, you need to build your immune system because you will not be back in here and possibly lose your life again because that's not a fun place to be. And, you know, at that point when I thought, you know, once I'm out of high school or college, 
I thought that, you know, what we're supposed to do in life is have the most money and make money and be rich and have a million dollars. And I learned, thankfully, at a young age that, you know, your greatest health, your greatest wealth is your health. And that all the money in the world could not save me at that point, you know, no matter what I did. You know, and, and there's presidents and rich people and billionaires, they lose their lives all the time because they did not put their health as a priority. So this is what's motivated me since 1995 when I started my plant-based, raw, nutrient-dense, fruit and vegetable diet, you know, to, to get healthier. And one of the principles I like to leave my life by is Kanai, C-A-N-I, and it's on the screen there. It's a constant and never-ending improvement. And this is a concept I learned in college. I didn't go to college for botany, horticulture, nutrition, or anything like this. I went to school for marketing. So if the title of today's presentation is a little marketing, you know, and catchy, that's why. But I use my marketing skills to educate and to help people eat a healthier diet instead of how most marketing is being used to, you know, feed people crap. I mean, literally, it is. I mean, we're marketed to all the time. If you watch TV, there's, you're bombarded with just junk food commercials that make it out to look good. You know, sexy people drinking Coke and all this stuff, you know? That's not the way. So I'm glad I could use my marketing skills to market the good, healthy stuff. So anyways, the Kanai is constant and never-ending improvement. And what that simply means is uh, Deming uh, was a businessman that went over to Japan after we bombed him. And he taught the Japanese how to always improve what they're doing. Even if they think they're doing it good, even if you think Dr. Furman's diet is the best, it could be better. And that's what I'm going to share with you guys today. Even if whatever your diet you're on, I don't care what diet you're on, as long as you're on a healthy diet, and a healthy diet contains fruits and vegetables. If you are eating fruits and vegetables, my talk will benefit you today because this is something that's not often talked about in the health food industry. I mean, in farming industry, it's talked about a lot more. But, you know, I kind of make the transition because I've been into the health aspects for 20 years. And for over 10 years now, I've been into actually growing, gardening, and really looking into how the food is produced in our society, which most people simply do not do. So all along, I've been trying to improve what I'm doing, and I want to encourage everybody out there to constantly and never ending improve. And that's why, you know, some of the Japanese cars, you know, Toyotas and Hondas, have millions of miles on them, they just keep running, whereas American cars and the American car companies don't use this constant and never-ending improvement, you know, uh, philosophy. And so that's the philosophy I use too. So ready for the three ways that I promised you guys? Well, here they are. Chew your food into mush, each mouthful to get optimal digestion, use a juice or a blender if you don't have the time to do this. Eat consciously, this is super important. You know, we're so often running here, running there, scarfing down our food and not letting it digest properly, you know, watching TV, being distracted. We need to be, you know, smell our food, taste our food, be with our food, you know. Digestion starts when you start salivating before you even put the food in your mouth, right? And uh, eat when you're truly hungry. Like Dr. Joel Berman says, uh, true hunger is felt in the mouth. So, yeah, that's my talk. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> well, these things are very important, you know, what I'm gonna teach you guys today goes well beyond that, um, and we'll just get right into that. Number one is increase the varieties of plant foods you're eating. As much as Dr. Joel Berman talked about, you know, the cancer-fighting pr protection of things in the brassica or cruciferous family, such as kale, uh, collard greens, bok choy, arugula, things like this, there's many other different kinds of foods that often get left out that are relatively unknown. So, you know, um, as much as kale and collard greens and cruciferous plants I eat, I eat a lot of other unknown plants to the normal American that have really high antioxidant, anti-disease preventions. And many people get into a routine. I know many people are like, like, oh, I have this same salad for dinner, or I have this same soup for dinner every night. And when you're doing that, you're limiting the amount of different phytochemicals and phytonutrients you're gonna get into. So what I like to do every night is always make something different. Even if it's just a couple ingredients different, that's going to allow my body to get different phytonutrients and phytochemicals. And instead of me living by my life by eating recipes out of a book, I live out of my garden. So I go out in my garden before I'm going to make dinner and I see what's available, what's fresh, what's really appealing to me. What do I feel like eating? What do, what's going to go ripe and go bad if I don't harvest it and pick it that night? So last night, you know, I harvested cucumbers and I made like a cucumber pepper juice soup, base soup, all raw, unheated, so I maintain 
the you know highest levels of nutrients in there, just in the blender and blended of us with some with some uh, you know raw macadamia nuts to increase the absorption of the phytonutrients in the different vegetables I was using and added some other seaweeds and other things in there. But you got to get out of the routines and always I encourage you guys to experiment and have fun and play in the kitchen. That's one of the things I love to do. And as I said, different foods have a plethora of phytochemicals, phytonutrients, as well as vitamins and minerals. And Dr. Joel Furman, I, I like his work a lot and recommend his, all his books to you. Hopefully he'll be here today to offer the books. And he says something that I, I really like. I may have taken it to the extreme. The nutrient you need the most is the one you're not getting. And that's, I mean, it's, it's simple. And most people are simply not eating some of the crazy wild foods that I've researched, learned about, and have taken the time to find out to grow them. You know, because a lot of the foods that I learned about didn't come from my research. They came from when I go to the industry trade shows for the health food industry. So the health food industry will come out with a little bottle supplement of ashitaba greens in a powder. I'm like, well, why should I get these ashitaba greens in a powder that's been fully processed, more likely heat processed, loses the enzymes, lowers the nutrition, when I can simply grow that food in my garden, have it water rich, and grow it in better soil, more than likely than how it's grown to be put in a package. So I want to subvert the whole commercial system by growing it myself. So the produce section of supermarkets appear, have, appear to have an abundance, and you go into the supermarket, you're thinking Whole Foods, wherever Whole Paycheck, you think, oh my God, there's so many different fruits and vegetables. Now, have you guys tried each and every one of the fruits and vegetables in the, in the store? Some of you guys maybe have, but most of you guys probably have not. But even so, that's a fraction of a percentage of all the foods that are edible on this planet. And you are being dictated to every day when you shop at the, even the farmer's market or the store on what you get to choose to eat based on what they're selling. If they're not growing it, it's not in the commercial system, you're not going to be eating it, and then therefore you're going to be missing out on nutrients. So I kind of like to think of this talk as extra credit, right? It's not it's absolutely necessary, in my opinion, to be healthy. Uh, you know, you could do it not eating all the things I'm going to talk about and do the things I'm going to talk about, but if you're out there like I am, for the ultimate and highest level of health, highest level of disease protection, trying to get better from different diseases in the body, you know, I'd highly encourage you guys to, um, you know, take what I'm saying fairly seriously. And then uh, I want to also encourage people to check ethnic markets for different varieties of produce that you may not be familiar with. So here, if you live in Las Vegas, you could go to a nice Asian market. Uh, SF Supermarket on Spring Mountain and Decatur and they have an a, incredible selection of Asian greens that you just don't see at Whole Foods, Smith's, Vaughn's and the standard grocery stores that are incredible, one of which is actually uh, in my talk today. So now I want to go over some of the different, uh, you know, unique varieties of plant foods I like. I couldn't go over all of them because I have a limited time here, but I'm just going to go quickly go over a few of them that I like a lot. Number one is cactus fruit also known as cactus pears, tunas. How many people have had this fruit oh, before? Yeah. Oh, good, a, a number yeah. of people, that's great. I mean, Dr. Joel Furman loves the cactus fruit. They taste amazing. You could eat them whole or fresh uh, juiced. They're antioxidant packed. I like to get the deep, dark colors when possible. So instead of getting the green ones, which are usually sweeter, which are kind of good, I like to get the dark purple ones or the red ones. They also have orange ones. There's over a hundred different varieties of cactus fruits that are available. And if you go to the supermarket, you know, to buy them, you're gonna maybe get uh, maybe about six different varieties that I've seen. I mean, here in Las Vegas, we're very lucky. The cactuses grow here in the desert naturally. Many are used as like landscape, and they have the fruits, and at the end of the season, I see the fruits drop on the ground, and yes, they can be eaten, you know, um, and they're really good. Some of them have less, you know, uh, fruit part in the middle because they're more of a wild uh, cactus fruit, but they're all edible. So. You know, one of the things they say is that cats cannot be vegan because, you know, if you're vegan, you, you can't get taurine and cats need taurine from animal products. Well, the amazing thing is cactus fruit is one of the only plant foods that actually contains taurine. And taurine is like an energy um, amino acid for us. So if you look on the bottle of the Red Bull or whatever, they, have, they list taurine as one of the things they put in, not from cactus fruit, unfortunately, um, as, as, an energy, as an energy boost. So that's really cool. So I, I just recently got a little kitty and I tried to feed her some cactus fruit juice. I'm like, it has taurine in it, it's good for you. And totally turned its nose up to it. But that's another topic. Anyways, uh, you know, 
and I want to get into also some of the benefits of some of these foods, but you know, part of me, I really don't like uh, going over the benefits of different foods because it puts us in the mindset of the, of the, of the cure mindset, you know, and I'm not saying any, any of these foods will cure anything. Um, because it, like we, we've all come to believe that, oh, if you're sick, go to the doctor, he gives you a pill for this. If you got high cholesterol, eat this plant. And you know, it's not that simple. You know, I think health comes from healthful living. Healthful living is basically what you're learning from Dr. You know, uh, Furman and Dr. Clapper. And you know, and by eating healthily, you'll be healthy, not necessarily like you could eat McDonald's and then have like one of these cholesterol lowering plants and everything's gonna be all right. No, you need to change your diet, get rid of the problem in the first place. So studies have shown the cactus beard may be helpful with inflammation, things like cancer, blood sugar, alcohol hangover, if you guys still drink, I don't recommend that, and uh, cholesterol. Next we got another one of my favorite plants that actually I picked from my garden this morning and made a fresh juice out of. This is another one that's, uh, you know, I learned at the health food conventions. It's known as Ashitaba or Angelica Kiske. This is a rare edible vegetable from Longevity Island in Japan, known as Hashijo Island. And for a long time, like, I, I was like, I saw they had this ashitaba powder and I'm like, oh my god, I want to grow this plant so bad, but how do I get the seeds other than flying to Japan to get them and bring them back? So I found a friend uh, who's into ethnobotanicals and stuff and I got the seeds from him. Now I'm growing it out and now I have grown it out so much that I have extra seeds to share with people that want to grow this nutrient-dense plant food themselves and I literally use this as a vegetable. It's related to the celery plant. I use the stalks as well as the greens in my foods and uh, today we just harvested a bunch of the stalks and the greens and put it into the juice and basically what happens is it bleeds a yellow sap and you can see a picture of the yellow sap and I mean, we bleed red. This plant actually bleeds yellow which is pretty crazy because a lot of plants you cut them and maybe lettuce bleeds white. You know if you've seen that, that stuff on lettuce that you probably shouldn't eat because it's not so good. But this stuff actually contains a, a chalcones, which is a special polyphenol that's been shown to you know, help with a lot of different conditions. And I mean, I eat for nutrient density, and I probably take this to the extreme, because I really eat for you know, uh, polyphenols and flavonoids and antioxidants and phytochemicals and phytonutrients. I don't necessarily eat for calories, especially as the, the older I get, I've learned that you know, we really need these plant protective compounds, and I'm glad I started this journey 20 years ago but now I get to even dial it in more. So the cool thing is something like the Ashitaba, like everybody in America can grow it, depending on where you live. Sometimes you can only grow it in the summer season, but here in Las Vegas, it will grow year round with an asterisk as long as we don't get a super hard frost. So I've had, had it in the ground for over a year now. I've been growing it for several years in Northern California, so it likes some more mild climates. It doesn't like when it gets a hard frost. Coastal environments would be great to grow this thing. But it's said to have vitamin B12, which is also pretty rare for plant food. Now, I don't know if that's analogs or not, because there's not a lot of research on that, but that is definitely really cool. And it's, uh, it may be helpful with shedding visceral fat. Dr. Furman talked about visceral fat. Um, they have studies on this, Alzheimer's, uh, skin, and lung cancer, cholesterol, and high blood pressure. I mean, these are some very healing foods. Next, we got another one of my favorites. Actually, I have a little uh, start right here. This is what it looks like in real life, if you don't want to look at the picture. This is known as the uh, Janeiro Procom Benz, also known as longevity spinach or cholesterol spinach. And these are foods that are not normally found in America, but you know, in traditionally in other countries, such as Thailand and uh, Asian countries, they, you know, they use this and they've been using it for thousands of years. But you know, Americans are not familiar with this because they don't take the time to, you know, sit on the internet, you know, half half my life to not only educate people and make videos, but also to research, because one of the things I've done, although I have a marketing degree, I spent the last 20 years learning about health and learning about plants, learning about soil biology, and learning how to do the best I can so that I can be the healthiest. And then I simply just share that with other people in my videos that I make all available 100% for free. So this plant is rich in phytochemicals and phytonutrients. It's a perennial plant in the tropics. It does not like freezing, and it may be helpful with cholesterol, diabetes, high blood pressure, and cancer. We can get into another one. This one's not quite as healing, but still very nutritious. This is known as Egyptian spinach or Malokia, and this is available at the SF supermarket. They may have a different name for it, but you want to look at the leaves, and I want to caution anybody to, before you buy any leafy green and start eating it in its raw state, some leafy greens do need to be cooked to get rid of toxins. So you want to you know, do some internet searches and use some common sense before when you get into buying new leafy greens that are you're not, you're not familiar with. One website I will recommend that's not in my presentation, 
is entitled pfaf.org, and this is a Plants for Future database, and they list like almost all the edible plants. What was that? Uh, pfaf.org. They list all the edible plants um, uh, on, in the, in, on the planet with a you know, scale of one to five for edibility um, and also for medicinal use. So you can learn about some of these wild ones. So I go to PFAF a lot and research different things and, and find out some of the more edible, delicious plants that I can grow and eat to get the health benefits. So this one's related to the okra. It has a mucilaginous texture, which is kind of interesting, which has its own health benefits right there. It's also, it's the vegetable form of jute and it's known as a king of vegetables. So jute is what makes the jute fiber that makes ropes and coffee bags and all this kind of stuff, so it's really cool. And it's said to be more nutritious as kale. And how many of you guys have ever had the Egyptian spinach? Yes. A couple people, you guys get A plus. All right, cool. So, um, but yeah, but most people don't know about this and they should be eating it. I mean, it has 12 times more beta carotene than broccoli, nine times more calcium than spinach. It's a summer grown vegetable, doesn't do good in the winter. It makes its own seeds and then you can replant the seeds and they come back up. It's amazing, it has a really good flavor here in Las Vegas. You know, I grow lettuce in the cool season, but right now it's too hot to grow lettuce. So my go-to leafy green in the summer is the Egyptian spinach that just grows like mad. Last year, and I have videos on this, my plants were like six feet tall. So imagine six feet tall plants. You could go out there Anytime, just pick all the greens. You don't have to go to the grocery store. It's much more convenient to have it in your backyard. You don't have to buy, you know, two, three dollar heads of lettuce that may not be the best for you, which we'll talk about in a little bit either. So this may be helpful with boosting your immune system, diabetes, and liver detoxification. Next, we got cannabis. Dr. Clapper talked about this yesterday, and I know what you guys might be thinking. Cannabis is what gets you high. So I'm, I, I want to make it clear, I'm not talking about getting high or any of the psychoactive effects from cannabis. You know, I know people have issues with that. I'm not, this, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the medicinal or nutrient dense properties of cannabis that is, that's not known. I mean, many of you guys may have seen a movie when you guys were younger, Reefer Madness, my dad saw that. It puts out a, it makes you think cannabis is gonna make you crazy and all this stuff. And, and it's just sim simply not true. There's a, a smear campaign by the government and potentially different corporations that was cannabis was infringing on the paper industry and all these different industries but I'm not really gonna get into that. But yes, the cannabis, also known as marijuana, which I like to say cannabis, it's a mostly unknown for its non-psychoactive health benefits. So it's not known for its non-psychoactive benefits, and that's the benefits that I wanna talk about. And as much as the US government claims it's you know a class one a drug and addictive and all this kind of stuff, and it's, it's outlawed, the US government also owns a patent granted in 2003 and the patent that the U.S. government owns is entitled cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants in the body. So I mean, our government's doing two things. It's illegal, but yet they have patents on life, on how it can be used as a neuroprotectant and an antioxidant. And it's a really healthy food. I would encourage people if they are able in their state and have a legitimate require, a need for it to get a a recommendation from a physician. Uh, you can't do that here in Nevada as well as in California. Um, Arizona. Yeah. Arizona, yeah, wherever. But yeah, consume raw. It doesn't have any psychoactive effects is what the doctors, like Dr. William Courtney, who's done a lot of research on this and working with cancer patients and other patients with ales, with the raw cannabis, you know, and Dr. Courtney would say, cannabis is the poster child for raw foods. And I'm like, haha, that's cool. I'm a raw foodist and I'm gonna, eat cannabis raw and I can't get high because I don't want to get high. But So I have an asterisk there as well and I have to tell you my story and if you want to see the full story it's actually on a one and a half hour video on YouTube. Um, you know, so the doctor said you can't get raw, uh, high from raw cannabis and I figured out a way you can't get high from raw cannabis. So you can watch the video to show how I did it and don't do it if you don't want to get high. But of course, you know, I would much rather somebody who wants to get high and have the effects do it the way I do it because I juice it with some special ingredients. And I would rather have people, you know, juicing it, getting the health benefits and getting high, <laughs> consuming it in its raw form than smoking it, and then I don't have to breathe the smoke either, right? Yeah. It's so much healthier if all stoners started juicing green <laughs> cannabis. Imagine what the world would be, right? They'd be healthier too, and they'd get high out of their minds for 10 hours. 40 ounces of juice, 10 hours I was high. And all, you guys laugh now. I mean, I might be laughing now too with you guys, but 
I was like a clock watcher. Like, you know when you've been at work, when maybe when you're a high school teenager, maybe even nowadays, you're like at work and you're like waiting for the, you're looking at the clock, waiting for it to be five, or if you're a kid in school, you're like, oh, three o'clock, I get off and I just want to be out of here. That's how I was. I was like, oh my God, I'm so high on life normally. And it's like, this is terrible. Oh my God, I want this to be over. And like watching it, I was like, oh, just end. I want this to end. I did not like it because I just like being high on life and I want to encourage everybody out there to be high on life and you can do that with a plant-based, high nutrient dense, fruit and vegetable diet that have boundless energy, have ulti ulti ultimate health. Anyways, uh, so consuming it raw may have psychoactive effects if you follow a recipe. You can look for that online, I'm not going to get into that. But it, in my opinion, it needs to be legalized for its vegetable uses and its health benefits, you know, yeah. non-psychoactive uses. And it may be helpful with cancer, tumors, autoimmune diseases, and inflammatory diseases as shown by the U.S. government patent, which is pretty insane. Now, if you think some of these foods are inaccessible to you, because maybe the cannabis, you, you know, it's illegal to grow it unless you live in the States and you have a, you know, a, a recommendation. Um, and you can't get the Ashitaba, and I do, we'll have seeds available, and I do have some of these uh, Gynera Procumbens uh, plants available today. Another food that's really available to every one of you guys, because I know you guys live somewhere, even in big cities, you guys can eat edible weeds. So yeah, I'm not crazy, you know, there's weeds that are edible, and while I'm not a wild weeds expert, I did have a wild weed expert on my show named Katrina Blair, which is a friend. She lives up in uh, Durango, Colorado. She does incredible work up there. But many weeds are edible and very nutritious, but yet you pull them out of your garden, you spray Roundup, hopefully you're not spraying Roundup, that's really bad stuff, glyphosate. Um, and, but we can eat them, you know, they're often discarded a nuisance, they're really rich in a, uh, you know, a plethora of nutrients that you're not getting because you're not eating lamb's quarter, you're not eating purslane, you're not eating stinging nettles. I mean, I go out to my garden and just harvest stinging nettles and just make a juice out of it. It's so amazing. It has like, reminds me of like a chocolate milkshake, like, I mean, I don't eat chocolate milkshakes, but just juicing the stinging nettles into my juice. And once you juice the stinging nettles or blend them up, you, they lose the uh, stinging aspect of them. And dandelion is known for its liver detoxification. They're available free wherever you live. Now you do want to be cautious in harvesting things out of this, you know, where there's freeways and all this kind of stuff, so use your common sense. I mean, obviously if your backyard's all, you know, overgrown and you're not spraying nothing back there, it's probably a good place, but you need to know about the most edible weeds out there. And I'm glad that Katrina wrote a book titled uh, The Wild Wisdom of Weeds, and in the book, uh, she identifies the 13 most common weeds and their health benefits. So I would encourage everybody to get that book, and the secret thing is, is if you go to my gardening channel, growingyourgreens.com, you look for the video with Katrina, I set up a special deal with her. Normally, if you just buy the book, you just get the book, but because I worked with her, I said, Katrina, can you do something special for my people? Can you actually collect the, the 13 weed seeds you know, and then include it with your book um, when my, my people buy it from you guys. So now you guys can get the weed seeds from Katrina for those weeds if you can't hunt and find them in your neighborhood or just growing in cracks. And you could grow, just throw them down. Maybe some, in some dirt in an empty lot, it'd be better if you grew them in uh, good rich soil. And they're gonna come up and you're gonna get familiar with the different weeds in the book. So you will be able to identify them as they're a little baby plant. When they get more mature, you'll get to taste them at different stages and get all the different phytonutrients and phytochemicals. I really like to eat baby plants in the microgreen or baby stage. I like to harvest my baby leaves for eating raw because they're more tender. And I like to use the larger leaves for juicing or blending when I'm gonna break up that hard fiber. And you're gonna get to have an intimate connection with the weeds that you'll be eating you know, by getting her book and the seeds, 13 seeds, um, you know, if you, you get the book through the special link that I have. So yeah, so that's uh, tip number one, way to better any diet you're on is by diversifying and increasing the diversity of foods and eating some foods that you may not have normally eaten. And so the foods that I share with you guys are some of the most nutrient dense foods that I've learned about to date. Next, I want to talk about something that's also, you guys, every one of you guys are being affected with all the time, is declining nutrients in food. And many people don't talk about this, they think, oh yeah, just go out to Whole Foods, eat fruits and vegetables, you're gonna be fine. Well, you know, we would be fine if this was about 100 years ago or 200 years ago before chemical agriculture, before tilling, before we're destroying the earth and, and all this kind of stuff. And the US Department of Agriculture has been compiling uh, data on nutritional content of food since the 1800s. Studies show that foods today have less nutrition 
you know, than in previous years. So a study published in 2004 in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition found that found reliable declines in 43 different fruits and vegetables. And a British Food Journal study found that 20 vegetables average calcium content had declined 19%, iron 22%, and potassium 14%. So I mean, and, and this is just from studies when they're picking whatever vegetables and there's no standards on how much nutrients a vegetable should have. I mean, you could go online to the USDA uh, nutrition database and pull up a carrot and a carrot's supposed to have this much nutrition. But how do you really know? Was that carrot grown with NPK fertilizer, which is concentrating on three minerals, or was it grown in a mineral-rich, 90-plus mineral soil, right? And, and, and between different farmers, organic growers, they may have different growing practices. And you guys have tasted this before. When you taste a tomato or taste a fruit, you'd be like, oh, that was one good tomato, and oh, that tomato really didn't taste good. So, I mean, taste is a really big indicator of nutrients. So let's look at a couple slides of the decline the average mineral content declined in selected vegetables between 1914 and 1997. This is the sum of averages of calcium, magnesium, and iron in cabbage, lettuce, tomatoes, and spinach. And as you guys can see, you know, it used to have a lot more nutrients in 1914 than it does in 1997. And this is not 1997 anymore, if you haven't checked lately. This is 2015. So I'm sure it's maybe, according to that, it's probably just flattened out. It maybe even declined. And you know, this correlation is not causation, so I want to make that clear, but, and also the diets of Americans have changed significantly since 1914, but, or 1980 in this, in this uh, uh, slide here. But basically it shows that there's a decrease in the minerals and there's an increase in disease. So I'm not saying this is the reason why disease is occurring, I'm sure it is also occurring because people are eating the, not the right foods, but this is a potential reason, in my opinion, you know, it, it does play a factor in disease. And Dr. Furman talks about this with certain mineral deficiencies, viruses are able to, you know, uh, morph and change into something that's gonna affect you versus something that's not gonna affect you. So these are some of the different minerals that are associated with different diseases and their declines. And let's get into some of the different specific nutrient changes on some of the measured nutrients from the USDA uh, published uh, studies. You can see this is for onions. You know, the, 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 the percentage decline is in iron, 46% less iron. Are people iron deficient because now we have less iron in the food? Is it because you're not eating enough meat? Well, maybe it's because the food of today, farmers are not putting iron back in the soil and they don't have the micro activity in the soil to uptake the iron into the plants, as well as other nutrients. Next, we're gonna talk about okra. You know, the iron is actually increased in okra, so if you want some extra iron, eat okra, but the vitamin C is reduced, the riboflavin is reduced. And these are just the minerals that are checked for in common agriculture. And common agriculture, I'll let you guys know that there's NPK fertilizers, that's if you go to the store, there's a bag of 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, that's the NPK, that's three minerals. And uh, universities talk about maybe adding 16 to 18 minerals into the soil to have fertile, rich soil. But in the earth, there exist in, in you know, uh, soils up to 90, 70 to 90 different minerals. Now, what happened to all those? Why are those being left out? What roles do those play in plant nutrition, which have, have not even been researched, or yet human nutrition, which we haven't really researched either? So as much as I believe in science, I believe science does not know everything, and we need to maybe, you know, kind of, uh, you know, do the best we can. So here's a change in the watermelon, has higher vitamin C these days, less iron, and a lot less riboflavin. Now, one of the changes that they say that the nutrients have changed, not only because of the mineral deficiency, which is why I believe it changed, but also due to plant breeding and having different varieties of produce, you know, these days than they had in 1950, for example. You know, they got whatever, all these seedless watermelons, and I don't know if they had seedless watermelons in 1950, I wasn't around yet. <laughs> Um, kale, your guys' favorite kale, you know, most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. You know, look at the decline, you know, 56% decline in riboflavin, 48% less in calcium. I mean, all the foods you could be eating could be higher in nutrients, but it's not. They're not. Parsnips, and we'll just go through this one. I mean, another decrease in parsnips won't bore you with more things. And you might be thinking, John, I eat organic, man, so I'm protected. It, it doesn't affect me. So yeah. let me tell you guys, organic farming, it is better, in my opinion, you know, besides not getting the pesticides and all the toxins in most cases and preventing those things from coming into your body in many cases, but not all, it is more nutritious. So I always encourage you guys to support organic. 
But even so, um, in my opinion, organic uh, grown produce in, from industrial farming, right? They're not doing everything they can to increase the nutrients in the soil, right? Uh, organic farming, some of the, you know, uh, the, the laws about organic farming say what you can't do. They don't say what you should do or what you must do to have high quality food. So nutrients in fruits and veggies, not all produce is created equal, factors that affect nutrients. Growing practices like adding in trace minerals, adding in microbes, you know, putting NPK fertilizer down. When is it, when is it harvested? You know, was the lettuce you're buying harvested two weeks ago and it's been sitting in cold storage in a fridge and it's been trucked across the country? You know, as time goes on, nutrition goes down. Um, age off the vine, once again, you know, age off the vine, that's super important. You know, the apples you're buying that are from the USA right now, here in June, are, were not just picked off the plant. They are from last year's harvest, last year, and they've been put in an oxygen deprived environment in cold storage so that they will last, they will keep, you know, for six months. And then they bring it to the store and then you buy it and a lot of the apples you're getting from the USA now, you may notice are soft and the mealier texture than when they're fresh harvested, you know, in like the fall. And this is the decline of the nutrients in the produce, also the textures. So I want to encourage you guys to, you know, uh, try to support your local farmers directly. Go to farms to pick your food. There's a great farm here in town. If you know, if guys don't know where what it is, it's called Gilcrease Orchard. You can pick your food fresh. They're harvested. Bring it home. So you're going to minimize the nutrient decline from age off the vineness. What I like to say, uh, post harvest practices is another way that nutrients can be reduced in the produce that you're buying. So for example, like cauliflower, they harvest it in the field, they immediately take the cauliflower out of the field, they put it into a cold refrigerated truck, this is known as hydro cooling, and for the industry this locks in the nutrients. Well, basically it locks it in so it actually doesn't spoil fast because if they just left it out in the sun, it would wilt and go bad, but the sooner and faster they can get into the hydro cooled, drop that temperature down to almost freezing, you know, it, it keeps the produce so it has what's called an industry leg or it stays it looks fresher longer, although the nutrition is affected. Another thing that can't create differences in nutrients is the different cultivars, as I kind of mentioned. You know, there's different kind of um, hybrid cultivars nowadays that aren't the same as heirlooms from long ago. So how do you know what is most nutritious? Well, you want to test, test, test. I encourage everybody to get blood tests. And what I like to do is test my food when I'm eating it. So you can purchase something like this. This is a Bricks refractometer to check your uh, the quality of the fruit you're eating. So we're just gonna go ahead and, and take an orange here. And how this works is very easy. Just take some of the juice of the orange and squeeze it on here. And you can look, and uh, on here, if I got it dialed in right, this is about a 14. And I wanna send two of these guys around so you guys can actually see what this looks, what I'm looking at. I mean, I have a good slide with it also. But you can literally do this with any fruit or vegetable. If it's a vegetable that you can't um, squeeze juice out of, you can put it through like a garlic press or a juicer to get the juice out. And basically, this is normally used by grape growers and they only harvest the grapes when it's at a certain sugar level to make wine because it's a sugar that ferments into alcohols. And most farmers don't even know why the, what this is and why, why it is important is because within a given species of plant, the crop with a higher refractive index, and that's what you're looking at, will have a higher sugar content, higher mineral content, higher protein content, and greater specific gravity or density. This adds up to a sweeter tasting, more minerally nutritious food with lower nitrate and water content, lower freezing point, and better storage attributes. So there's a basically a chart you get, and it's a refractive index of crop juices. So we're looking at oranges today. These are organic oranges from Stealthy Farms in Southern California. If we look on the chart, an orange, a poor orange is six, an average orange is 10, a good orange is 16, an excellent orange is 20. And for anybody that has that, what is that reading at? I think it was about 14. 15. So that's not even a good orange. I mean, and this is what most of the produce you guys are buying in the store is. I mean, I've tested a lot of produce and it usually falls between good and average. Some of the grapes come in, you know, up, you know, really well, but a lot of produce is average or good. Now, I don't want to be, I don't want to be average or good because if you're average or good, you're going to get what every other American gets or got. <laughs> So analog is better than digital in this digital age. Analog is better than digital. And this is an analog bricks refractometer. They do have a digital one that costs a lot more. They may think it's better. But what we're looking at is we want to look at, besides just the number, another thing that's very important to look at is the fuzziness of the demarcation line. So you can see not fuzzy. It's like literally white and blue. 
And then the fuzzy one, you kind of see like there's a gradient in there right at the demarcation point. And we really want our produce to be as fuzzy as possible when you're selecting out. So we want a high number and fuzzy. This will let you know that it's more nutritionally dense than not. So, you know, what I believe everybody should do is take the Brick's refractometer when they're buying produce and Whole Foods has great customer service. If you want a sample of fruit before you buy it, they will do that for you. You can also take a little bit and put juice on your refractometer to check out what it is. And um, if you go to a farmer's market, you can ask for a sample and you can check it. And if every American went to the store, went to the farmer's market with a Brick's refractometer, then we may see a change in the system. Okay. I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon, but I wanna let you guys know to do that. <laughs> Because produce is grown for quantity, not quality. And this really bothers me, right? They're just, farmers are just paid on the, pro, on, the, on, the, on the poundage, right? And this needs to change if we want to be optimally healthy because there's not the nutrients in the foods as you guys saw that there used to be. And farming is a big business and organic is also a part of the business and the, all businesses are there to make profit, not necessarily there to make you guys healthy. What if every American checked their bricks in Japan, they're starting to get this. So they have specialty gift stores that have, you know, that they sell fruits. And here's a $21 apple. I'm not saying for a case, that's $21 for one apple. It's known as the Saikai Inchi. I don't know, I'm not Japanese, so I might have said that wrong, so sorry if you're Japanese. But it means the world's best. World's best apple for 21 bucks because they want quality, they appreciate quality. You know, these are given as gifts in Japan, and you know, uh, that's where the, grow, the grower really takes the practices seriously to grow the best. So what's the solution to this? The solution is to grow your own. By growing your own, you can make a significant dent in the produce you purchase. This is me in my backyard <laughs> uh, with all my meadow lettuce um, and pepper plants that are growing and now making peppers for me. This was taken just a few months ago. Um, you could grow higher quality, more nutrient dense because you could add nutrients to your soil. You could also grow unlimited varieties instead of being dictated to what you're going to eat based on what's in the supermarket. You could pick up a rare seed catalog, rareseeds.com, Baker Creek. They have over 1,300 different varieties of different foods in there. And if you guys like to cook your squashes, you guys are going to be amazed because you thought there's only like kabochi, kabochi butternut, and, and spaghetti and all this stuff. They have like over 100 kinds of different squashes and each one tastes a little bit different. You could probably eat a squash for a whole year. Every day you could have a different one. And most people have never tasted the different varieties. This makes me sad. There's also many other health benefits of growing your own. Of course, you're gonna be out in nature. You're gonna get vitamin D in the sun so you don't have to make your own. If you're out extended times in Las Vegas, I do recommend wearing some kind of protection. I like to wear clothes for fur protection and especially for my face. I'll be out in the sun for a little while, but then I like to put on a nice wide rim hat. You're gonna have a connection with nature in today's age. You know, we're so much inside, living on the computer, working on the computer. We need to get back out to nature to appreciate nature, have our feet on the ground, be grounded and have a connection. It's also great to de-stress because it's just nature, it's happening, and there's no demands on you when you're outside. You also get plenty of exercise, lifting compost bags, hauling around plants, bending over, digging, shoveling, turning compost, and more importantly, you get to know where your food came from. And furthermore, you know, this just shows, this, one of these last slides shows that some of the differences in the nutrient quality, which is very important to me, so they did a test between store-bought beans and garden beans, and the garden beans were grown under nutrient-dense conditions, but not even under optimal or the best conditions. And you can see the bricks was higher and all this kind of stuff, and that's cool. But I want you guys to focus on the nutritional quality at the bottom. This is very important to me, and this is really something that's not talked about. As you guys can see, you know, uh, the minerals are much higher, some of them a lot higher, you know, and some of them are not as high, so I don't, you know, but mainly it's higher. And the other thing that's higher, almost double, if not double, almost double, is the protein content. Everybody always says, where do you get your protein as a, as a vegan or somebody that eats a plant-based diet? I get you get it from fruits and vegetables, but what if you could have 50% more protein, you know, in the foods and eat half as much foods to meet your protein requirements, you know? We don't want to eat protein in excess, in my opinion, you know, but we could eat less food to get the same amount of protein, so one of the things, and other nutrients, so one of the things I've learned is that by growing a garden, I don't need to eat as much food, I can eat less food, which is less caloric density, but also get more nutrients at the same time. And if growers and farmers took this up, there'd be more protein in the vegetables, and if you're eating animals, you're not immune because the, the animals are eating feeds that are nutrient depleted, in my opinion, and they are also biologic accumulators. 
So increase the protein content as well as mineral content. And when that increases, we can surmise that the phytochemicals and phytonutrients also increase. Not all gardens are created equal. This is very important. If you're going to grow a garden, it's, I think it's great that you're growing a garden, but you can do practices that ensure you're going to have the highest quality food versus just being able to grow stuff that's going to be probably better than most things in the grocery store. But I really want you guys to strive for the best. So I want to encourage everybody to grow beyond organic food. And to do this, you'll need a few inputs such as compost. And most people think of compost as bacterial-based compost made thermophilically with a heat pile, which is available which is mostly available if you go down to a local big box store or a nursery supply store. But there's also a fungal dominated compost that's very important that's made with low heat that has a lot of fungi in it. So we have beneficial bacteria and beneficial fungi in us and they're important for our digestive and, and uh, immune system. But it's also very important for the soil. It's very funny how the soil and we are related. Um, so it's very important to get the fungal component, also adding the rock dust, which adds up to 70 different trace minerals into my soil in the amount that nature would have put them there. So I don't have to be a scientist, I don't have to say, put this, this, we just dig up rocks that have a lot of nutrients in it, put it in the soil, and then it just, it grows. Also ocean solids, because nutrients have been leached away from the mountains into the ocean, the ocean solids can have up to 90 different trace minerals, so I like to boil or feed or spray on my plants up to 90 minerals so that they'll absorb them. You know, and this is all in natural amounts. Of course, another component is microbes, the bacteria and fungi are essential for the garden. This is the component that most chemical farming is missing out on there and they're destroying the microbes in the soil because it's the microbes that basically digest the nutrients, the rock dust, the organic matter from the compost and make it into plant available nutrients. And then I always like to say that manures is how a lot of the food in America is being grown. It's being grown from manures from factory farms, and if you're a vegan or plant-based person, you do want to be concerned about this because, number one, it's a waste stream product from that industry that your food is being grown on, and many people use manures in their garden and think it's the end of, oh, I use manure, it's all right. Well, the, the animals take out from the food what they need, and they poop out the waste products, and they've already taken out a lot of nutrition, number one. Number two, unfortunately, most manures I would consider contaminated with different things like, you know, GMO re residues, antibiotics, and E. coli and all these things, and that's why there's outbreaks on different crops because of this. And so I don't necessarily recommend using manures unless you can get a really clean source. So in summary, eat new varieties of fruits and vegetables for unique phytochemicals and phytonutrients. Purchase the highest quality produce from the store or direct from farmers markets by checking it with your bricks meter that's going around and grow your own to have the best food on the planet. Let's give it up for John Kohler. So I do want to mention that I have over 800 videos online, all for free. You guys can watch on YouTube if you like my presentation here. My presentation style is similar. I cover a wide variety of topics. I have over a thousand videos on growing your greens, which covers all ways to grow your food. I talk about my healthy plant-based diet that I've been doing for 20 years on okraw.com with over 450 videos on that channel. And then you can support me by purchasing a juicer if you need one or blender or dehydrator at discountjuicers.com. I also have a related YouTube channel um, where I demonstrate the machine so you can learn how they operate and why they may be beneficial for you. Also, I do have bricks meters available today if you're interested in checking your food to eat a higher quality and a few of the uh, seeds and plants, some of them that I've mentioned in my talk today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And John is, he has a table at the exhibitor place. So if anybody wants to meet John and have any questions answered, John, you're going to be there today, right? Yes, I'll be there right now. Thank you. So uh, I got one Briggs meter back, so if you have the other one, I would just request that you just uh, bring it to me over at my table. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. All right. Let's give it up for John. All right, so you guys made it through the whole entire video. Congratulations. You know, I mean, people paid a hundred dollars a day to attend the health happiness in healing event and i spoke with you know many other different presenters such as dr joel Furman, dr michael clapper and a whole bunch of other people talking about living a healthier plant-based lifestyle and not only about the you know the diet but also about the lifestyle in general and getting enough sleep being more motivated you know having a good attitude you know these are all aspects of health, but for me, you know, one of the most important things that it comes down to is you guys are what you eat. And if you didn't learn anything else in this talk, the presentation I gave is that 
I want to encourage you guys to eat a higher quality food. And unfortunately, even if you're getting organic, and yes, or buying organic in the store is better in most cases than buying some conventional stuff, you could even take it to the next level. I mean, I'm here in my front yard garden and I'm surrounded by these beautiful nasturtium flowers that could be eaten you know, in salads and nasturtium leaves can also be eaten. Actually, they're quite hot and spicy. And you, 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 you yourself could grow very nutrient dense foods even if you don't have space for garden, even if you have a kitchen or live in an apartment or RV, you can grow sprouts and microgreens that take very little space you know, using some of the techniques that I share on growingyourgreens.com. And you know, another thing I showed you guys is how to select the highest quality produce at the store because we've all gotten that peach at the store that's nice and rock hard. It never really ripens up, never really gets sweeter, and it tastes like crap. But using that Brix meter, and you know, I want to encourage you guys to do a Google search right now, Brix meter, B-R-I-X meter or refractometer, zero to 32, and pick one of those guys up and so you could actually start testing your fruit or vegetables and getting the highest quality so that you'll get more nutrition and that's why I'm doing all these videos for you guys, right? I'm literally sharing with you guys what I've learned over the last 20 years and giving you guys the fast track shortcut, right? When you play Monopoly and you pick up that card that says, you know, pass, go and collect $200, right? That's what you guys get with me and all you gotta do is just spend some time to invest in your help because I do this for you. I don't, do, I don't put up videos for me, I, I do this because I want to help you guys and I'm literally glad to be alive because I almost lost my life when I was younger. In any case, if you like this format and want me to film more of the presentations that I give live because as many times as I come from a garden and make a video for you guys, I give a lot of live presentations and I do like to put those up you know, in full length unlike most other YouTubers that teach on plant-based raw food, whole food diet, you know, they don't put up too many of their videos that they give live because they are full of a chock full and well full of knowledge. Instead of just little five minute snippets where you don't get the full story to take your health to the maximum level. So anyways, uh, like this video if you like it and you want more. Also be sure to subscribe if you're not already. Be sure to check out past episodes. I have over 400 episodes now on all aspects of living a healthy plant-based, fruit and vegetable based raw diet. Once again, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best. She's been into raw foods now for the last six years. And the question for Megan today is, do you need superfoods on a raw foods diet? Superfoods. Oh, there's like such a 